Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Monday Night Travel with Rick Steves Europe. I'm Lisa Friend, and I'm delighted to be your moderator this evening with our tour guide, Rick Steves. Hi, Rick. Lisa, how you doing? Fantastic. Jet lagged and in withdrawal from Turkish coffee, but otherwise great. <laughs> I heard you had just had a fantastic time with, uh, what, 20 or 25 of our guides doing our Best of Turkey tour. Yep, 22 guides, including two people that just went on your recent training guides, That's Andrea right. and Nancy. Andrea and Nancy, beautiful. I sure enjoyed seeing the pictures and it makes me really homesick for Turkey. I love that tour. And of course you had merit for your guide. He's a treasure. He's a treasure. Well, it's uh, and we try to do that every winter, by the way, is uh, um, subsidize a tour so our guides, when it's the off season and there's no tours to do, can actually have the experience of being a tour member. And it is quite an interesting uh, opportunity, isn't it, Lisa, to, to, to be in a place where you're sort of overwhelmed and it's all new and uh, you're the tourist instead of the guide. It always gives you really good empathy to walk a mile in your tour member's shoes, sit on the bus, think about, you know, yeah. looking left and right and all the things. And, and Turkey is such a wonderful country that it makes you feel welcome, but it also feels so exotic. Well, I'm so glad you guys had a good trip. And it reminds us that there is travel going on, even with the pandemic. And I don't know what's exactly right and appropriate and so on, but we've been traveling a fair amount. Most of our staff, it seems like, is getting over to Europe and back. Um, and um, we're just hopeful that next year it's going to be comfortable, it's going to be stable, and we are on a trajectory to a point where we can travel in a way that there's no anxiety. I mean, we're, it looks like we're going to be living with this um, COVID for a while, you know, but we're going to be living with it here, and we can live it with it overseas too. And our the general consensus is Europe is getting it together, uh, and we feel as comfortable in Europe as we do here. More about the pandemic, if you want, is in a one hour special we did right here for Monday Night Travel a few weeks ago. You can look at that in our archives. I'm actually kind of right off some travel too. I, I just, for my first time since COVID started, I went on the road and, to give lectures and so on. I was in Detroit and in Santa Fe in the last week. I, in Detroit, I was working with Detroit Public Television, making a pledge special. I'm so excited about our new pledge special. It's about the Why We Travel special that we did. We're gonna produce it for a national pledge event in March. And I'm kind of excited because this is one of the gifts I held up. Rick Steves on the hippie trail from Istanbul to Kathmandu, what's with that? I wrote a journal back in 1978 and we were featuring it on my Facebook page and we talked about it here on Monday Night Travel. And all of our travelers, you guys, just said, we want more of this sort of Rick's coming of age trip. So we transcribed the journal. It's 60,000 words, it's a 140 page book. And that's one of the gifts that we're gonna be offering in March with this pledge drive. But I'm very excited to share that. And then I flew to uh, Santa Fe because I was invited by the Conference of State Governments to give my travel as a political act talk to 18 state government officials, senators, representatives, mayors, governors, uh, and, and public servants. And it was a great experience. And what was really cool about it, their mission is our mission. Let's get it together for the common good. And their mission was to bring it together in our divided society. And it was half Democrats, half Republicans. And there was a feeling of, we are public servants. We've got to respect each other. We can get over this division. I know it's it's a little tougher than that. And I know it's probably tougher than that in Washington, DC, but these people were state government officials. And I had the honor of giving them my very most um, passionate and important talk, travel as a political act tailored to their work. And it was just really exciting. And I'm just kind of on a high after that. But by the way, I'm just so on a high right now because you're all dropping in as we do every Monday from Monday Night Travel. And today we're going underground. So I'm gonna take you deep below Europe all over the place. But first of all, I wanna talk about our food and our drink. I'm gonna be, it said on our promotion, I was gonna have red wine, but I thought pizza underground, I'm going to have beer. So I got my, my Belgian beer here, Stella. Stella is kind of uh, nostalgic for me because back in, when I was a kid leading bus tours around Europe when I was in my 20s, the cheapest beer was Stella. And it was just the, the skunk water that they sold in the tour bus cooler uh, back then. And today, Stella is a darn good beer. It reminds me the Belgians. You know, if you go to a fine wine shop in Paris, you got French wine from every region of France and you got the beer section. There's no French wine, beer in the beer section in a French winery. It's all Belgian. That's the really great beer or the French do the great wine. And I'm gonna be eating pizza. 
Now I've sh held up my dinner for 50 weeks in the last year about all of my food and I've never given you leftovers before, but this, I gotta be honest with you, this is leftovers. This is what's left of what I ate at the six at the at the early show tonight. You're the late show people, and I just I'm going to finish this off. This is a lot of great pizza, and this is pizza Talio, Talio. It's spelled T A G L I O. It's from a restaurant in Seattle called Bar Talio. But the keyword here, wherever you live, is Talio because that's not a pizza pie, you know, where you just order one pizza and it comes like this and you eat it. It's a big square platter that is cooked and then you buy squares of it and they sell it to you by the weight. The fun thing about that is you and your favorite travel partner, you get to buy a variety. And that's what we got here. And I'm just enjoying a beautiful, beautiful dinner. Let me give you a quick tour of my pizza. On uh, this end, this is called puttanesca. And we try to do a family show here, but sometimes the culture demands that we give a little insight to the rough edge of Europe. Puttanesca means the, the prostitute's pizza or the whore's pizza. It's fast, it's spicy, it's easy. It's got anchovies, olives, and capers. Uh, spaghetti puttanesca is also a popular dish in Italy um, with the same toppings. This is a potato pizza, surprisingly good. A potato pizza, and that's also going to have pecorino cheese and rosemary with it. This is your basic salami pizza. This is, um, this is the margarita. And the margarita is, well, margarita was the first queen of Italy. Italy was united back in 1870 and they're all excited. And they thought, what can we do? We wanna make a pizza for the queen. And what are the colors of the Italian flag? Well, it's red tomato, white mozzarella and green basil. So that's a margarita pizza named after the queen of Italy. I'm gonna be enjoying those. And right now, I hope we're all gonna be enjoying a little underground Europe. But before we do that, I wanna kick things off with a little bit of our game. Where's Rick? It's a drinking game. Grab your Coke, grab your wine, grab your Stella. And we're gonna do five teases and you gotta guess what is the show topic. It's always a tease. We start the shows off with Hamrick, Steve, back for more of the best year up this time. We're doing this, that, and this because we are in, and then we reveal it. And uh, I'll help you out here along the way. But uh, if you get it wrong, you got to get a take a drink. And if you get it right, you got to take a drink too. All right, let's see what this is like here. Hi, I'm Rick Steves, exploring more of the best of Europe. This time, we're going medieval, cruising river gorges steeped in legend and climbing castles in the most romantic corners. Ooh, it's a castle in a river. Hmm, robber barons. Of Germany. The Rhineland. Hi, I'm Rick Steves, back with more of the best of Europe. And this is one of about a million reasons this place is called the City of Light. Oh, the tragedy of that fire a few years ago. They're rebuilding it. Where are we? You got it. We're in Paris. Thanks for joining us. It's a beautiful Notre Dame. Hi, I'm Rick Steves, back with more of the best of Europe. This time, we're enjoying the delights of the French countryside. It's the chateaus. And I'm enjoying the delights of riding a bike through a beautiful garden on a river by a chateau and remembering the my Loire lines. Loire River Valley. The Loire Thanks River for Valley. Us. Nice. Hi, I'm Rick Steves, back with more of the best of Europe. This time, we're enjoying some underappreciated corners of Germany, both old and new. And I'm enjoying the best harbor tour anywhere in Europe. It's Hamburg and a whole lot more. Thanks for joining us. Hi, I'm Rick Steves, back with more of the best of Europe. This time, we're in the south of France, mixing Roman ruins, fine wine, a little Van Gogh, and even a French bullfight. Get ready for not a year, but an exhilarating half hour. I'm in a Roman arena, 2000 year old arena. They say the best Roman ruins are in this part of France. Where could we be? In Provence. All right. Okay, we're gonna go on a montage of underground sites now. I just had so much fun putting this together. So we're gonna start off in Nuremberg in Southern Germany. While this church, along with the rest of the city, was heavily bombed in World War II, much of its art survived, thanks to heroic and creative efforts by its citizens. One part of Nuremberg that avoided bomb damage was underground, 
its vast and long-established network of waterways, tunnels, and beer cellars. They were outfitted as air raid shelters. During bombing raids, tens of thousands of locals took refuge down here. It's also where countless art treasures, both local and looted, were safely hidden away. Boy, this is really, uh, for me, it's fun because I love making TV. I think about the challenges of the producer here. Simon's got us down here in this underground sort of labyrinth, and you got to get establishing shots where the, the me and my, my friend walk by, and then you get point of view shots, what we'd see as we are walking. You got weird and interesting light, and you hide behind corners, shining a light so people are backlit. Uh, we've got to train our local guide who can be the best guide in Germany, but he's never talked really to a host with while walking by a TV camera just how to do that. You got to rein me in because I know what I want the guide to say, and I keep stepping on his lines and just calm down, Rick, let him talk. And then the camera person has to anticipate all the moves and do the beautiful pans and walk backwards while he's shooting without tripping. Think of all that goes in to putting a little bit like this together. I just absolutely love it. To learn more about this and not get forever lost down here, we're joined by my friend and fellow tour guide, Thomas Schmechtig. So Nuremberg was bombed quite late in the war and we saw what happened to other cities. So we actually prepared for the war and reconverted these old beer cellars into air raid shelters. That's, for example, where the guards used to be who protected the artworks which were stored in here during the Second World War. The Nazis hid crates of great art in many different rooms in this sprawling underground network. This is one of the many rooms down here which were filled up with art. Nuremberg was back then nicknamed the treasure chest of the German Empire. Plus, the Nazis looted lots of artworks. From countries that they conquered and they brought it here. Correct. Okay. For example, right in this room, they had the crown of the Holy Roman Emperor. So right here in these cellars were some of the great treasures of European culture. Correct. We didn't just dash the art treasures down here. They were carefully packed. For example, here, Rick, you see the wonderful stained glass windows from our St. Lawrence Church that were taken out pane by pane and then put into those wooden grates. By the way, this is sort of famous now because somebody wrote a book about it, they made a documentary, and they made a movie about it, The Monuments Men. The book was The Rape of Europa, and there's a documentary about it as well as a movie about it. The movie was fine. I thought the documentary was even better, and we had the honor of inter inter interviewing the author and the producer of the book and the TV show, and we've got it in our radio archives. So you can check that out. There's actually a link to it in the chat section, as we always have links to everything. So go there and listen to that interview because it's fascinating. Think about it. They put all of the art treasures in German cities underground because they were afraid they were all going to get destroyed with, a, with the approaching bombing. Made sense to get it underground and save it, which did save it. And then Hitler was also looting great art from all the countries he invaded and then bringing it back to Germany and hiding that too. There was so much art underground in Germany. And then after the war, how do you get it back to the rightful spot? How do you save it from the weather? How do you save it from looters? That's what the Monuments Men were all about. This was a group of American and British um, military officials, officers and so on, whose mission was after the war to get the art back into its proper spot. It's a fascinating story. You can check that out. The humidity was very dangerous for the artworks. So they air conditioned the whole place in here. So this huge duct was made in anticipation of the war. Yes, and already in 1939, before the war broke out. The bombing, of course, eventually came, and this surviving underground network became the foundation for rebuilding the city. So it did make sense to rebuild the city on its original footprints. We have miles of underground which survived the war. They date back to the Middle Ages. That, for example, is an old water conduit system. Okay, Hello? well, that was uh, Nuremberg in southern Germany, and I just, I really enjoyed Thomas, my guide, so much. I just love him. Now, we're going to go to Cornwall for, and meet another wonderful guide, Tim. And, uh, you know, throughout the world, when, you know, about a century ago anyways, people said, a mine is a hole in the ground with a Cornishman at the bottom. The people of Cornwall, mining dominated. So we're going to get a little context here, and then we're going to go underground into a tin mine. With its ethnic cousins, Brittany, Ireland, Wales, and Scotland, Cornwall was part of a Celtic crescent that nearly circles England. The Cornish people spoke their own language, which thrived for centuries. Mining and fishing were long the dominant industries, but today, tourism drives the economy. 
Cornwall, with a half million residents, is a county of England, unlike the more autonomous Wales and Scotland. But many native-born locals consider themselves Cornish first, British second. The area is packed with ancient sites, historic monuments, and peaceful farm hamlets. The Gulf Stream brings warm, subtropical weather to Cornwall, making it perfect for gardens, walking, and basking on the beach. From the start, Cornwall's economy was based on tin. As far back as ancient times, Greek and Roman traders traveled all the way to Cornwall for tin. You see, an important step in the evolution of civilization was the ability to mix tin and copper to make bronze. And when people entered the Bronze Age, they could make better tools and stronger weapons. By the way, look at that scene. I mean, look at the light. Look at the drama. Look at the energy and everything. I'm a big fan of the TV show Dark. It's filmed right here. And I was so excited to be able to do our show on the same spot where they shoot, where they shoot Poldark, because I just think it's just, it's just lovely. And I was hoping and praying for good light. You need good light when you're in England. And we certainly got it. Also, when I was right here, there's all these beautiful trails and hikes around Cornwall. And I looked into that and now I'm into long distance hikes because of the joy I had on the, on the Tour de Mont Blanc just recently. And there's a Cornwall trail. It's part of the Southwest coastal path. And you could do an extended walk in this area and have just a delightful time. Tin mining was the dominant Cornwall industry well into modern times. This evocative coast is dotted with 19th century industrial age ruins. These desolate engine houses once pumped water out of the shafts so they could mine a half mile down and then, under the seabed, far out to sea. The ground here is honeycombed with mine tunnels. In its heyday, there were hundreds of tin mines in Cornwall. The industry peaked about 200 years ago with the Industrial Revolution. Back then, the demand for tin was huge, and mines like these were booming, making Cornwall one of England's wealthiest counties. Ruins look almost ancient, but it's easy to forget that less than a hundred years ago, thousands of workers spent most of their waking hours in these crumbling buildings, supporting their families. But Cornwall's glory days of tin passed. The iconic smokestacks today are the dramatic remnants of Cornwall's now-dead tin mining industry, which just couldn't compete with cheap tin from abroad. Along with these old buildings, another reminder of the mining heritage is the tin worker's simple lunch, the Cornish pasty. So this is such a fun little bit to do for the TV show because everybody sees pasties in the bakeries when they're in England. And here it's got historical context. It's got, it's got cultural importance. It's, uh, it's, I've got a great local guide that can explain it to me in his voice and a peaceful spot to film it. And then it's beautifully shot, beautifully edited, and Steve Cameron, our editor, puts in some lovely music. Enjoy this little bit as we learn about the English pasty. So this would be the classic miner's lunch, you could say. Yeah, the Cornish pasty. So you'd uh, hold it on the crimped edge around here like this. And the idea was that uh, if you did have arsenic on your hands, then you would leave it on the crust. It's because there's no way to wash your hands when you're mining. It's exactly. Just, you come yeah. out of the mine and you're going to eat and you're hungry. Yeah, absolutely. So this is a pasty. How do you pronounce it? Pasty. Pa yeah. Not pasty. No, pasty. Pasty. All right. Yeah. So eat away. Mm. Generally, what do you put inside of a pasty? You've got steak, mm -hmm. onion, potato, and turnip or swede as we call it. So any bakery around here would serve these. It'd be a great takeout meal for a, for a traveler. Yeah, absolutely. They, there are thousands of these made every day. God, the original takeout food in Cornwall. I mean, 200 years ago for the miners and today? Yeah. For us travelers. Hmm. The last tin mine to close is now open to visitors, dedicated to telling the miner's story. The Giver Mine closed in 1990. It represents the last hurrah not only of Cornish tin mining, but in a sense, of Britain's industrial age. Exploring it, you'll gain an appreciation for the simple yet noble life of miners. Though closed for decades, it feels as though the miners could show up at any time to clock in. The blasting schedule was a reminder that punctuality in the mines was a matter of life and death. 
The miners' lockers were left just the way they were on the day the mine closed, with the miners believing that somehow they'd be back. Photos humanized the plight of individuals who lost their livelihoods. They remind us that when economics change and an industry dies, it devastates families and entire communities. In a huge... Boy, I've been thinking about that, you know, the reality of the struggle of coal miners in West Virginia and so on. And it's nothing new. England has gone through it. England, of course, was the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution. And slate mines in Wales no longer employ slate miners. Uh, coal mines up in the north of England no longer employ coal miners and tin mines down here in Cornwall, once the biggest employer of the land, no longer do that. These are tourist attractions now, and these economies have transitioned into something more sustainable and more in tune with what we need today. It's a tough thing, and we can learn from other societies as they have learned to adapt, but it's not easy, that's for sure. Structure nicknamed the mill, the stone was crushed to extract the tin. The miners brought in tons and tons of raw ore, which was put into big drums like this, which would then tumble. And with the help of metal balls like this, it would break the ore into smaller and smaller pebbles. The noise must have been deafening in here. You'll see how a vast room full of shaking tables, like giant machines panning for gold, separated the tin from the waste. Tin and other heavy metals are the dark material at the back, while the lighter waste slowly shakes forward. With 90 tables shaking, each day hundreds of tons of rock gradually gave up a few tons of coveted tin. For th Boy, there's a whole lot of shaking going on there, I'll tell you. Now, we're gonna put on the hard hat and the miner's outfit, and we're gonna go into the mine here. And uh, what a great opportunity for filming because we had an actual miner who's retired and now he takes the visitors through the mine and tells them the story, but what a great voice such an unvarnished and candid look into that slice of English heritage. And we got to go down there and check it out. And I do want to remind you, these mines go down and then they go out under the seabed. It was very dangerous hundreds of years ago, very dangerous to this day. Finale of your visit, you slip on a coat, don a hard hat, and head both underground and back in time, deep into one of the original 18th century mines. The shafts, narrow and low, give you a sense of the difficult life of miners and their perilous working conditions. Former mine employees serve as guides and are happy to tell the story. Well, here we are. We're in a section of tunnel that's uh, 250 years old, approximately. Uh, this mine itself didn't work under the ocean, but a lot of mines in this district, the St. Just Mining District, um, went under the ocean for sometimes a distance of a mile and a half. Tin mining is hard rock mining, where you look for a load and then follow veins of tin through the surrounding rock. And once they establish where the tin is, then they then work upwards through the earth and downwards through the earth, extracting that vein from the rock. Even under the sea, if necessary. Even under the sea, yeah. So if they took 100 tons of rock out of the mine, how much tin would they hope to find? Just one ton. One ton, that's hard work. It is extremely hard work. Cornish mining had a diaspora in the 1800s, with large numbers of skilled miners emigrating. The Cornish miner has moved all over the world, from Canada and North America, Mexico, down into South America, New Zealand, Australia, South Africa, uh, even Cuba. There's hundreds of thousands of people around the planet now that are directly related to those Cornish miners who took their skills with them. And in fact, there was a definition, and it still holds true today, really, largely, that a mine is a hole in the ground with a Cornishman at the bottom. Hmm. Okay, now we're going to do something entirely different. We're not going to have a fancy TV clip. This is just my simple iPhone, you know, ad lib uh, video clip that I would grab for my Facebook page. And we are in the south coast of Greece, in the Peloponnesian Peninsula, a place I went to as a kid, or a, a backpacker, called Pyrgus Daru. And you go from, I mean, you're pulling from one stalagmite to the next stalagmite as you float through this amazing cave. And it's just right next to what the ancient Greeks thought was the mouth, the mouth sort of gateway to Hades. Let's go down to the south coast of Greece now, Pyrgus Daru. We 
Twenty-five to thirty million years old. 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 Twenty-five to thirty
two shows, one early, one late. We're going to Christmas in Europe. Here's a little sneak peek of what we're going to do. Our most cherished Christmas traditions come from Europe. I'm Rick Steves. Join me in experiencing seven cultures, a rich variety of traditions, and countless voices as we celebrate a European Christmas. Wow. I just, I can't get enough of that European Christmas show. It's been, you know, it's, a, it's been out a while, but it's still a, a standard thing in public television. They run it all over the country. And what I like to do is give you a behind the scenes look, and that's what we'll do next week. Hey, we're going to carry on a little bit, but right now I want to take you just for a moment to ricksteves.com. It occurred to me as we were looking at that last show, we've got so much information packed into this website. Of course, we sell stuff. We've got our Christmas sale going on right now. And that's uh, in the web store at ricksteves.com. Everything is 20 to 50% off. But I want to drill down into some of these other tabs and remind you, you can learn all about our tours. We have a thousand departures next year, 40 different itineraries, and you can learn about what's going on there. Uh, we've got a whole almanac of information about Europe. Uh, we've got our annual Christmas um, fundraiser for Bread for the World, as we want to collectively do something substantial to help our country get on board to fight hunger, both at abroad and at home. Every year, we've done this for, for several years now, we raise $1 million between you and me. I do a challenge. I'm going to match the first 5,000 people that can give $100. That's $500,000. I'm going to dig deep and give $500,000 and together. We're going to raise a million dollars to empower Bread for the World, to work in Washington, D.C., to encourage and educate our, our, our legislators to understand the value, the pragmatic value, as well as the love your neighbor value of fighting hunger, both at home and abroad. And with COVID and with what's going on in Afghanistan and with climate change, well, I'll tell you, there's a lot of, lot of prayers going up there, and this is how prayers are answered. So if you'd like to join us, click there and you can learn more about that. Of course, we've got all of our TV shows that we've ever produced available for free anytime without ads on our TV section, 600 hours of radio shows that you can enjoy, and Classroom Europe. And the money, Monday Night Travel is pretty much all about Classroom Europe. And if we go to Classroom Europe, um, we've got this opportunity to go into the public playlist up in the top. And then you can type anything you want in the text bar there. I'm going to type in, how about underground? underground. And then right away, you get a, a playlist that is built for underground. And here you see Nuremberg, you see Cornwall, you see Spain's Civil War, you see Poland's Great Salt Mine, you see the caves of Slovenia, you see the catacombs in Rome, and you see London's Churchill War Rooms. That's what we're watching right now. We are watching a playlist about underground Europe. So if you would like to go to underground Europe, or if you'd like to go anywhere, you can do that with the help of Classroom Europe. And that's just something that we are so happy to offer to school teachers. And it's a chance for you to go traveling anywhere you like. So I'm going to right now um, remind you that the, uh, the Monday night travel cannot happen without our crew. We've got Lisa Friend, we've got um, uh, Gabe, we've got Ben, we've got uh, Ann, uh, we've got Amy Duncan helping us right now in the chat section, answering your questions, and we can't do it without their help, and we can't do it without the help of Kate Mulhern Graham. Kate Mulhern Graham, she for one year has been bringing us food from restaurants, and I just want to thank Kate, because Kate has a passion for local restaurants, and every week we've been able to hold up beautiful food and celebrate European culture and good European food. Uh, thanks to Kate's passion for helping good restaurants. We all know that we can shape the future by how we consume. If you want a future of great deals on six inch and 12 inch um, Subway sandwiches, you can consume there and shape the future. If you'd rather have more fast food, you can, you can, um, you can consume there. If you wanna have small family run, individual one-off restaurants healthy, we can consume there. Uh, this is from Bartalio in Seattle. We hope that you can support your local one-off restaurants. And I've been enjoying my spread. I want to remind you, Pizza Talio is a great way to have pizza when you're on a, uh, just having a quick light meal anywhere in Italy. It's pizza that is sold by the little square and it is sold by the weight. And in Italy, they have this thing called an etto. 
and netto is 100 grams. And 100 grams is about a quarter of a pound. So if you know what a quarter pounder is, you know how much pizza you're going to get for an etto. Hey, right now, I want to remind you that we're going to go underground. And this next stop is one of the biggest places of worship, I would say, in the whole world. This is the place built to honor the victims of the Civil War in Spain. For another thought-provoking excursion, we're side-tripping from Madrid up into the Guadarrama Mountains. A 500-foot-tall granite cross marks the Valley of the Fallen an immense and powerful underground monument to the victims of Spain's devastating civil war. In the late 1930s, a million Spaniards died as conservative Catholics in the military slugged it out against secular Democrats. Unlike America's civil war, which pitted North against South, this war was between classes and ideologies. It divided every village. The right-wing fascists ultimately won, and Franco ruled Spain as its dictator until 1975. You know, Civil War. It's kind of chilling to me that some Americans talk flippantly about civil war. They say their, their gripe with the other part of our society is worth pulling out guns and shooting each other. Civil war is real. Civil war happens. We have that, you know, 150 years ago in our, in our story. But there are horrific civil wars on this planet. And if you're thinking that any of the squabbles in our country are worth a civil war, please go to Spain and learn about their civil war. I mean, it's not cut and dried. It's not us and them. It's not North and South. It's families. It's, it's communities having to take a side because the middle is blowing out of the water and everybody has to be extremists together. This visit here to the memorial tomb of the victims of the civil war is enough to make you want to go home and talk common sense into people who would ever talk lightly about a civil war. Let's go right now one hour outside of Madrid to the Valley of the Fallen and see what happened when fascists overran the country of Spain. The sorrowful Pieta draped over the entrance must have had a powerful impact on mothers who came here to remember their fallen sons. A solemn silence fills the basilica. As if measuring sorrow and distance, this 870-foot-long chamber is far longer than any church in Europe. The line of torch-like lamps adds to the somber ambience. Franco's prisoners, the enemies of the right, were put to work digging this memorial out of solid rock. Franco's grave takes center stage. Some Spaniards come here to honor him. Others come to be sure he's still dead. You know, sometimes it's frustrating when one of my TV, come, TV shows becomes out of date for some reason because something changes. But this is a change I'm kind of happy for. This is wrong now. Franco is no longer there. He was the centerpiece of this memorial, Franco. But Franco in 2019 was exhumed and he was moved and buried uh, next to his wife in a little town where it made, Spain did this because they didn't want to have such a convenient place for right-wing extremists to come and, and celebrate uh, their, their ideology with the, uh, with, with the standard bearer of their politics, uh, generally Simo Franco. So you won't find him in the Valley of the Fallen anymore. But interred here in chapels flanking the altar, are the remains of tens of thousands, victims from both sides, who lost their lives in Spain's civil war. With every visit, I stare into the eyes of those angels with swords and think about all the heroes who keep dying for God and country at the request of the latter. Those angels just are chilling. Ah, geez. Hey, uh, you know, when you go to Madrid, this is a, a side trip. It takes an hour to get there. When you're in Madrid, think of it. In one hour, you can get to Toledo, you can get to El Escorial, the palace of the, um, of the Inquisition. You can get to the beautiful town of Segovia and you can get to the Valley of the Fallen. Right now, let's go all the way across Europe. We're gonna go up to Poland and we're gonna go into a salt mine and have an, another massive underground place of worship and a place you can lick salt off the walls. The remarkable Vialichka salt mine just outside of Krakow has been producing salt for eight centuries. Today, it's busy not with miners, but with tourists. 
After descending 200 feet below the surface, you follow your guide on a mile-long downhill stroll, getting a memorable peek at life in the mine. It's vast, nine levels, a thousand feet deep, over a hundred miles of tunnels. For centuries, generations of Vialichka miners spent their daylight hours underground, rarely seeing the sun. Proud miners carved figures of great poles out of the salt. You'll see legends from the days of King Kazimierz, when one-third of Poland's income came from these precious deposits. The famous astronomer Copernicus. And even the region's favorite son, Pope John Paul II. The total number of chapels in this mine is over 20. This is the oldest chapel in this part of the salt mine, St. Anthony Chapel from 17th century. Everything here is around is made of salt, even the chandelier, salt crystal. Visitors expect salt white, but it's black, but it's salt. If you don't trust me, you can taste it. And salt preserves everything. Take me as an example. I'm 65 years old and I'm still fresh, still young. The mine's enormous underground church, carved in the early 20th century, is still used for mass. Everything here, including the ornate altar and the grand chandelier, is hewn from this underworld of salt. When the tour is over, a small but industrial strength lift beams you up. All right. Well, we've done a lot of underground. We got a little more Poland in a minute, but you know, we just were talking about uh, great poles made of salt. You know, we like to have poles, little flash surveys here uh, with Monday Night Travel. And today we were uh, huddling and figuring out what, what kind of pole should we have? And we thought, let's have a pole pole. A pole pole. Yeah, why not? So we're going to give you a chance to vote on poles and see which one you would like to be as part of your next vacation. Lisa, do we have a poll about poles? We have a poly pole. And I will launch it right now. Launch that baby. There you go. So the question is, which of these poles would you most like to have be part of your next vacation? You get one choice. I've been raving about a hiking pole when I was doing my long distance hike around Mount Blanc. So you could vote for a hiking pole. There's a lot of good fishing in Europe. Uh, you know, especially in Scotland and Ireland, people love to go fishing. You could have a fishing pole as part of your next trip. Maypole, if you're into traditional German slap dancing and yodeling, you want to wear a, wear a, a lederhosen or a, or a dirndl, you might want a maypole in your next trip. You could have a pole, a Polish person for your next trip. And there's 30 million of them if you go up to this beautiful country we've just been visiting. And you could actually put the South Pole as part of your itinerary. So there you got two for five different poles. Now the ball's in your court. Vote for one pole and we'll see which pole is the one we want collectively. And while we're thinking about that and doing that, I wanna go back into our video clips and we're gonna go back to Krakow where we just saw the salt mine. And we're gonna to go to a site that was very big news when they opened it up a decade ago. And this is underground Krakow. Uh, you know, uh, we have underground Seattle here. It's a very popular attraction. Underground Krakow has a little more history. And they dug down and they found the underground, the, the, what used to be the regular streets, and all the little shops, and they display it today with the goods that those shops were selling. Join me now with a little quick um, iPhone, Facebook video clip underground in the wonderful city of Krakow. Hi, I'm Rick Steves. I'm underground under the market square in Krakow, the historic capital of Poland. I'm with my guide, Anna. Nice to meet you. Hello, Anna. And we're 500 years ago. The city looked like this. We're in a wonderful new museum. This is state of the art. What's what's this museum called? It's Museum of the Underground Krakow. Yes. Under so underground, and we get a look because they were renovating the main square, and they found all of this history underneath. And and we have like a bunch of little shops. Here, what are we buying here? This is oh, a shop. Oh, we have got jewelry pieces, buckles, uh, horseshoes. Uh, and, knives, and here, what do we have? Kind of things. Oh, look like this is in buckles. The yes, there we have some buckles. So each one of these little displays would be a shop they found that might have lined the market square because all of the trade in the Middle Ages would be here. There's horseshoes. So yes. this would have been a blacksmith yes. with nails. There's his nails from 500 years ago. And we look at each of the little stalls, and uh, 
Here we can see uh, locksmiths. <laughs> locksmiths, yes, the products like padlocks. Locksmiths had to have perfect reputation because you always had to deal with such production. And they had to have knives, that's knives. very good. And? And shoes, the most famous in Europe, not only here in Krakow, produced locally, but uh, fashionable in the countries of Northern so Europe Krakow as well. Krakow had all the necessities for good living, and when we visit the underground museum, we can appreciate that. I'm Rick Steves in the historic capital of Poland, Krakow. Happy travels. All right. Well, there you go. A little bit of Krakow there. And um, I do want to remind you, I love making these little candid video clips for my Facebook page. And if you'd like to follow that, I bet I've done a thousand of these such clips over the years for my Facebook page. Um, join me, friend me, whatever you call it. Rick Steves at Facebook, and I'd love to have you along. Got about a million people that follow me, and it's a lot of fun. Right now, I'm with the TV crew, and we're filming the greatest art in Florence, Rome, and Athens, and we're featuring it every day with a post on Facebook at Rick Steves. Hey, Lisa, we were just in Krakow enjoying that, and um, you know that, that salt mine was um, a suburb of Krakow. Krakow is the most popular site in uh, in Poland for understandable reasons. The very powerful concentration camp is, is nearby and the city itself is just endlessly entertaining. So that's a, 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 an amazing stop. And uh, you can certainly um, make friends with some polls there if you want to poll in your next vacation. But what do we have on our poll poll? Well, obviously uh, your description of Polish people was very effective. They came in a second with 21%, but the Mont Blanc episode really stuck with people because that came in first, a hiking poll with 46%. Well, we have an active, we have a, a hearty and active group of people here on Monday Night Travel, it looks like, and uh, rather, <laughs> I think that really is very interesting. I'm glad you want to do a hiking poll more than you want to go to the South Pole, and uh, I'm glad you'd also like to go to Poland. Thank you, Lisa, for the poll, and thanks everybody for playing that. Now we're going to go to Slovenia, and Slovenia is the lucky part of, Yugo, of former Yugoslavia. Of course, Yugoslavia fell apart, and they had a civil war there after the breakup of uh, the, the Warsaw Pact and the end of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War, and the lucky part of former Yugoslavia was the northernmost um, state that's just snuggling up against the Alps. They've got their own ski resorts. They've got their own mountains. They're just right across the border from Austria, uh, and it is Slovenia. Cameron Hewitt, who's um, our very uh, talented and prolific uh, co-author here, uh, his favorite country in all of Europe is Slovenia, and he's taken me around there for good reason. It's wonderful. Uh, we want to take you to Slovenia right now, and uh, I know from years of going to Slovenia, it's famous for its caves, and there's two of the most famous caves, Postojna and Skotsjan. Postojna and Skotsjan, and which one is better? Well, I spent a whole day studying both of them and measuring the pros and cons. It's not, it's not a definitive, this is right and that's wrong, but depending on what you're looking for, I think Skotsan is best, and I'm gonna show you why right now. Come with me to the greatest cave in Europe, in Slovenia. A short drive takes us into a totally different landscape. Slovenia's karst region, a high, fertile, and wind-blown plateau. In this land of stout hill towns and rugged farmers, grapes for the full-bodied local red wine thrive in the iron-rich soil. Since the limestone upon which everything around here sits is easily dissolved by water, the karst is honeycombed with a vast network of caves and underground rivers. The most dramatic cave to tour is Škotsjan, Visitors begin by seeing a multitude of formations in a series of large caverns. Guides tell the story as drip by drip, stalactites grow from spaghetti-thin strands to mighty sequoia-like stone pillars. In the grand cavern, the sound of a mighty river crashes through the mist. Chiseled into the wall, the scant remains of century-old trails evoke the early days of tourism here. It's a world where a thousand evil Wizard of Oz monkeys could comfortably fly in formation. Crossing a breathtaking footbridge 150 feet above the torrent gives you faith in Slovenian engineering. The cave finally widens, 
lights. Sunlight pours in and visitors emerge like lost creatures seeking daylight into a lush canyon. Nearby, wedged into another karst region cave, is Predyama, one of Europe's most photogenic castles. There's been a castle here for nearly a thousand years. The mouth of the cave provided a strategic place for some feudal lord to stick his fortified manor house. This version dates from the 16th century. While there's little reason to go inside, the castle makes an ideal spot for a scenic drink and a great capper for our visit to the karst region. All right. I gotta say, I'm enjoying my pizza. I'm not able to eat it all. I've been munching on this for a couple hours now, but it is sure, sure tasty. And I'm gonna have some pizza as we go together to Rome. When you go to Rome, remember, you've got lots of tombs. Ancient Rome had pagans that lined the roads that came into Rome with their memorials. So people would always remember them. The Christians, they went into the catacombs and outside of the city walls, you've got catacombs ringing the city. Most of them are marked by a church. And the church marks the spot where there was a home of a Christian that let them use that land to dig down and bury their loved ones near a martyr or something like that. That was back when Christians had to kind of stay a low profile and they worshiped in people's homes. They had home churches. Later on, when Christianity became legal and the dominant religion, those well-established home churches became the site of a bigger church that we see today. And we'll see that in just a minute as we go underground in Rome to check out the catacombs. For a little early Christian history, we're heading outside the city for a look at the catacombs. Rome's ancient wall stretches 11 miles. It protected the city until Italy was united in 1870. From gates like this, grand roads fanned out to connect the city with its empire. The Appian Way, Rome's gateway to the east is fun to explore on a rented bike. It was the grandest and fastest road yet, the wonder of its day. Very straight, as Roman engineers were fond of designing, it stretched 400 miles to Naples and then on to Brindisi, from where Roman ships sailed to Greece and Egypt. These are the original stones. Tombs of ancient big shots lined the Appian Way like billboards. While pagans didn't enjoy the promise of salvation, those who could afford it purchased a kind of immortality by building themselves big and glitzy memorials. These line the main roads out of town. Judging by their elegant togas, these brothers were from a fine family. This is the mausoleum of Cecilia Metalla, whose father-in-law was extremely wealthy. While it dates from the first century BC, we still remember her to this day. So apparently, the investment paid off. But of course, early Christians didn't have that kind of money. So they buried their dead in mass underground necropoli, or catacombs, dug beneath the property of the few fellow Christians who did own land. These catacombs are scattered all around the city just outside the walls, and several are open to the public. The tomb-lined tunnels of the catacombs stretch for miles and are many layers deep. Many of the first Christians buried here were later recognized as martyrs and saints. Others then carved out niches nearby to bury their loved ones close to these early Christian heroes. Hmm. By the Middle Ages, the catacombs were abandoned and forgotten. Centuries later, they were rediscovered. Romantic age tourists on the grand tour visited by candlelight, and legends grew about Christians hiding out to escape persecution. But the catacombs were not hideouts. They were simply budget underground cemeteries. Okay, this next little bit, it's not underground, but I just wanted to keep it in because I think it's fascinating, it's beautiful, and people don't know about it. Nobody goes there. Rome has an aqueduct park. And you got to remember, 2,000 years ago, Rome was a city of a million people. They needed water. And what did they do? They're great engineers. They engineered these aqueducts that would bring the water in from mountain springs. They're miles and miles long. They're engineered in a way so they lose one inch every hundred yards for many miles. So gravity rather than peasants can carry the water into the town. And today you can go outside of Rome to this one little spot, the Aqueduct Park, and see a great example of Roman engineering from 2000 years ago. Further along the Appian Way is Rome's Aqueduct Park, offering a chance to see how the ancient city got its water. With its million people, Rome needed lots of water. 
these ingenious aqueducts carried a steady stream from distant mountains into the city. And they still seem to gallop, as they did 2,000 years ago, into Rome. These aqueducts were the Achilles heel of Rome. If you wanted to bring down the city, all you had to do was take down one of the arches. In fact, in the sixth century, the barbarians did just that. Without water, Rome basically shriveled up. Today, the park's a favorite with locals for walking the dog or burning off some of that pasta. Okay, well, now we'll go underground in Rome. And just a month ago, I was in Rome with uh, my TV crew, and I was in Rome with 25 of our new guides on our guides mentoring tour. And we palled around with Francesca, Francesca Caruso, and she took us to the National Museum in the Palazzo Massimo, just about a block in front of the train station in Rome. And we found this beautiful painted basement. And in this ancient 2000 year old basement, the Romes painted this lovely scene so they could escape the heat, go underground, and be surrounded by this lovely art. Listen how brilliantly Francesca just ad-libs this tour, as I'm so lucky to be her, her student as we go through and see this beautiful example of ancient Roman painting underground. Buongiorno, I'm Rick Steves. I'm in the Palazzo Masio at the National Museum in Rome. And uh, you'll notice not a lot of tourists, they're all at the Colosseum, hot and crowded, waiting to get in. I'm with Francesca Caruso. Francesca. Hello. <laughs> Where are we going to go right now, Francesca? We are now going to go into the underground dining room of the villa of the Empress Livia, the wife of the first emperor. So imagine walking down a few steps in the dark. You're leaving the heat of a summer day, and all of a sudden, you're in a garden underground. The Romans are asking us to participate in an illusion that you can be in a garden with a blue sky, the birds chirping, the flowers blooming, and yet you are underground. Imagine the Emperor Augustus and the Empress Livia 2,000 years ago looking at these frescoes the way we are looking at them now. Feel the breeze moving the branches. It's a quiet garden. Everything is blooming at once, plants and trees that never could are all blooming at once. The breeze moves the branches. The only presence of man that we find is in this wicker fence and the wall that is the limit of the garden. And then it's plants and blue sky. 2,000 year old frescoes, an underground dining room from ancient Rome. It feels cool. That was the whole point, that you would be dining here and you would forget the heat of the day and the glare of the sun out there. And this is a rare example if you want to see Roman painting Yes, outside of Pompeii, come to the National Museum of Palazzo Massimo. There's the finest ancient Roman painting outside of Pompeii. Absolutely beautiful. Yes. I don't know about you, but I was just taken. I was taken back to ancient Rome 2,000 years ago with the uh, brilliance of a great local guide, Francesca Caruso. I'm so thankful we have Francesca on our crew. Every, nearly every one of our groups that goes to Rome get to know Francesca. We were just there a month ago with our guide mentoring tour. And Francesca took us onto a rooftop of a hotel that we, uh, we were friends with. And we had lunch there. And Francesca gave us a talk about how to give a good talk. And then she took us into the Vatican Museum, took us to the Pinacotec, the painting gallery of the Vatican Museum, and just knocked our socks off. Once again, this is the Palazzo Massimo. It's the National Museum, one block in front of the train station in Rome, the Termini Station, no crowds, the greatest surviving pieces of Roman art. Now, we're going to go up to London for our, for our last stop on this underground tour of Europe. And we're going to go back to a World War II site, another World War II site. Of course, Hitler had his underground hideaways. So did Churchill. And, uh, you know, the, the British government had this hideaway underground of free from the bombing risk. And that's where they ran the battle for Britain defenses. And thank God they got to survive that war and win that war. And right now it's a time warp. It goes back to 1945 to see how Churchill led Britain. And this is a beautiful site. It's just five miles from Big Ben or five prime minutes. It's just a five minute walk from Big Ben. Let's go now to learn more about Churchill and London's cabinet war rooms. 
like Winston Churchill have long lived and worked on Whitehall. Here, Churchill's wrapped in the iconic trench coat he wore as he led Britain through the dark days of World War II. Duck under sandbags and descend into the Churchill War Rooms. This was the secret underground nerve center of the British government's fight against the Nazis in the desperate battle for Britain. Shut down after victory in 1945 and ignored for decades, it's open today as a fascinating time warp for visitors to explore. Audio guides give it meaning. On the morning of the 16th of August, 1945, the day after VJ Day and the end of the war, the map officers tidied their desks, switched out the lights for the first time in six years, and went home. And that's the way the room stayed. You'll see the room where Churchill famously took his short naps. In this room, the progress of the entire war was followed as day-by-day -day movement of troops and convoys was charted. And this room was the communication hub from where Churchill maneuvered Britain to ultimate victory. The adjacent museum introduces you to Churchill the Man. It brings the colorful statesman to life, complete with his trademark cigar, bow tie, cognac, he loved his drink, and famous hat. You'll get a taste of Winston's irascibility, wit, work ethic, even the industry of kitschy knickknacks he inspired. Well, I hope you enjoyed our look at underground Europe. I certainly did. I enjoyed putting it together. It reminded me how much there is underground in Europe to enjoy. I've enjoyed my dinner. I want to remind you once more, I've been enjoying what's called pizza taglio, T-A-G-L-I-O. And that's pizza that is sold by the weight on the streets all over Italy. I've enjoyed my uh, pizza puttanesca. That's the horse pizza. That's the spicy with the anchovies and olives and capers. I've enjoyed my uh, potato pizza with rosemary and pecorino cheese and, and potato. It's very nice. I've enjoyed the basic salami pizza, always with tomatoes and uh, beautiful uh, mozzarella cheese. The margarita, which is named after the uh, first queen of Italy because of its colors, the colors of the Italian flag, green for basil, white for cheese, and red for tomato. And my pizza la rosa which is tomato and garlic so um i did my best i didn't quite finish it but i sure enjoyed it i've been washing it down not with dutch beer but with much nicer belgian beer if you want good beer in europe go to belgium go to germany or go to the czech republic if you've got something to add to that do it on some other monday night travel Thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you've enjoyed Underground Seattle. Underground, underground Seattle. All my life I've been going to Underground Seattle. Underground Europe. Lisa, do we have some questions? We do have some wonderful questions, but before we get to them, could we please have a word from our sponsor? Oh, sure. Thank you very much. Well, we've got Amy, who's working uh, with all of the people in the question and answer corner. We've got you, who is moderating this evening, and me, and there's 97 other of us here at Rick Steves Europe. And we're holding it together. It's been a long pandemic. When everybody gets their vaccinations and the kind of if we get our act together, we can actually have some normalcy. But we are very thankful that we are still healthy. We're still together. And we seem to be making progress on this. And we're confident that we can go to Europe next year without any recklessness or risk to our health, unreasonable risk. I mean, there's going to be risk if the pandemic is going by living here or living there. Seems like half our team has been to Europe in the last couple of months. You just got back a couple of days ago. I got back a week or two ago. And I, we found, I think, that Europe is really grappling with it in a pretty aggressive way. And uh, I feel just as safe in Europe as I do here. I don't know about you. Did you feel fairly safe in Turkey? I felt very safe. I just got back about 12 hours ago. So it feels fresh. like 12 hours. It's been 24 hours now. You got fresh experience. Well, we're just hopeful that uh, we can continue to um, stay healthy and that our, our country and, and uh, the rest of the world can uh, get a grip on this because we've got a lot of traveling ahead of us. Uh, we've got our tour program primed and ready to go. We are huddling and we are staying atten uh, paying, paying attention to the news. We don't know exactly what the future holds. We would never sacrifice anything in the area of safety for our, our travel dreams. But if it is reasonable to be going, we're going to have a heck of a year traveling next year. And if you want to know more about that, you can certainly 
look into our website and see what's going on with our tour program. Next week, a week from tonight, we've got a celebration of Christmas in Europe. Then we're going to take a couple of weeks off. And on January 3rd, we're going to get back together and kick off our 2022 season with the best of Switzerland. And then we've got a lot of travels after that. So thanks again for joining us. And Lisa, let's have some questions. Okay. Colleen wanted to know, when you've been underground in some of these places, have you ever seen any wildlife? Yeah, I've seen really weird, kind of emaciated white things that have no pigment. Uh, and uh, they're just living at the bottom of caves and stuff. And guides like to show that off. I've been in a lot of caves around Europe and there are creatures that live in there, but they're usually deep in the cave creatures that, I don't know, I'm no bio biologist, but um, they're, um, you wouldn't imagine seeing them outside in the sunshine, that's for sure. Okay, seven-year-old Augie asks, if you travel to England, do you speak British? You know, sometimes I wish I did because, and you know what I'm talking about, You're, you've traveled a lot in England. There is quite a, there can be a language barrier. Um, I like traveling in England and struggling with the language barrier. English is, uh, the, the British, the Queen's English is easy to understand. But when you get into the far corners of Britain, Northern Ireland, Wales, and Scotland, that's where you feel like you're understanding foreign language. Um, uh, but um, yeah. nope, we speak English, they speak English, and um, you can understand most of it. I'm sure he is happy about that answer. Laverna asks, what is the best question that you ask locals to validate and understand the history and magic of the places you visit? How do you connect? It's a good question. I, the most important way to connect is to meet people on their turf you know, do something that local people do, not that tourists do. If you, if you, if you go to a, a tourist, you know, like a, a, a Kodak moment kind of tourist show where you got all the cliches on stage, you're just going to be rushed in and rushed down. You're part of the economy and they, and they, you know, they do all their cliches. But um, if you go to a pub, you know, and you, and you have a, buy somebody a beer and, and uh, go to Scotland and, and buy somebody a scotch and ask them to teach you about scotch. Um, go to Turkey and play backgammon uh, when you go to the tea house, uh, uh, you know, go to Poland and, and have a shot of vodka, um, you know, go, go, to, go to a market in uh, southern France and, and let somebody teach you about, about their truffles. There are ways to let people on their territory, on their, in their zone, what they're passionate about, show off. And I just think it's really great to let Europeans show off culturally. Uh, be prepared to listen and uh, not be interesting, but be interested, you know. Um, I think that's really important because people are proud of their culture and they love to talk. That's great advice. Uh, let's see, Michael wants to know if, if you have toured the sewers in Paris and would you recommend them? I, Michael, I was thinking about add, adding that to this show. I wanted to do the catacombs in Paris where all the bones are, but I think we've done that on other Monday Night Travel shows. And I want to do the sewers of Paris. They say they stretch. If you were to line all the sewers out in Paris in a long line, they'd go from Paris all the way to Istanbul. So flush twice, you know. Um, and <laughs> I just love uh, the getting under the streets and seeing how cities work. And uh, the sewer tour in Paris is actually a serious look at, at the evolution of sewage systems and uh, what's going on in Paris today when you flush the toilet. That'll have to wait for another tour or another Monday night travel. Uh, so this is a weird segue, but uh, many people commented tonight that there should be plans for a Rick Steves cookbook where you and tour guides provide recipes and explain maybe the history or the culture surrounding some dishes. Mm -hmm. At first, I laughed at that. The first sentence you said, a Rick Steves cookbook, but then you said, where guides share. And all of a sudden, my little entrepreneurial wheels started spinning. Wouldn't it be great to have 100 guides each with a two-page spread with a beautiful photograph a little, and a photograph of them eating? And then they would explain their favorite food and why from their culture, what it means to people there and how to cook it. That's a good idea. <laughs> That's a very good idea. It wouldn't be me. Because that's not, I'm, I'm, a, I'm out of my league there. But there's a lot of foodies among our guides. And they know their culture and they love to eat well. That's a great idea. Okay, we'll keep that in mind. Seriously, Lisa, remind me that uh, later on. That's, I love that idea, really. <laughs> okay, so you mentioned that you did a recent talk with politicians. 
And um, someone was wondering, did you notice them having a willingness to work together or was it as divided as the media portrays it to us? First, I got a, um, I went last, just last week, I was in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and they had the Conference of State Governments. And it was like 800 senators, representatives, um, mayors, governors. I had lunch with the governor of Kansas. I had dinner with a senator from West Virginia and a senator from the new, uh, the new mayor of Lewiston, Idaho. I mean, these are very red states. And um, they hired me to come there and give a talk about the value of travel and how it broadens us up to the world and how it humbles our ethnocentricity and how we all got to be friends because the challenges threatening us in the future are going to be blind to walls and impervious to conventional weaponry and they're going to inquire embracing science and working together with other nations and having good governance and you know I, was, I gave them my common sense lessons from travel reminding them Mohammed said don't tell me how educated you are and tell me how much you've traveled Thomas Jefferson said travel makes a person wiser if less happy and Rick Steve says the best way to learn about your home is to leave it and look at it from a distance uh you know get out of your comfort zone celebrate culture shock it's the growing pains of a broadening perspective it was so good to get on stage and grab that mic and just you know knock it out of the park I hope and um I felt I felt I don't want to sound too you know Gazi, but I felt togetherness there. Their mission was to work for the common good in our country. And they know we're a divided nation, but they know that we can respect each other and we can get something done. And my favorite thing was breaking bread with people from red states who had constituents that are celebrating things that I'm lamenting. You know, when it comes to, well, I don't, I don't even want to politicize my talk right now. I just, when it comes to something that, you know, liberals cherish and conservatives are going to win, you know, we can get together. And the news media makes it sound like everybody's at their throats. But these were dedicated public servants, Republicans and Democrats, 50 50. There was as many uh, either on, on either side. And their, their home base is in Kentucky. And they invited me to come and, 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 um, and uh, box their ears a little bit. I did the medieval jester thing. You know, why did the king give the jester room and board? His job was to go out of the comfort of the castle, out of the security of the castle, and hang out in the ravine, in the barrio, with the angry peasants, and learn what they're talking about, and what their frustrations are, and what they're, how they're joking about the king, and then go back into the walls of the castle and tell the king what's going on out there. To me, to a certain degree, that's what a travel writer is. We go out. And then we come home and we bring home with us a broader perspective and the determination to share with our friends and our loved ones what a beautiful world this is and how we can all get along. <laughs> so that's what I got to do. And um, I felt very good about it. So thank you for that question and giving me a chance to think about it because it really was an uplifting experience for me because it was bipartisan. That's absolutely heartening. I really appreciate that. So I will uh, give you this one last question that will probably not elicit uh, any emotion or controversy. Uh, did the Polish salt mine have a particular smell or aroma? And did you lick a wall? I did not smell anything other than the dankness you get in big underground spaces. It's funny because I can still I can still smell what it was like to be there. And I really enjoyed the taste I got when I licked the ceiling. <laughs> I didn't lick it directly. I wet my fingers and went up there. And then I, and I go, oh, that's good. I'll do a little bit more. Because <laughs> it was salt. It was lovely salt. And of course, salt was, every tour guide has all sorts of stories about how salt was not just what you put on your eggs, but salt was life-giving. It kept you in meat through the winter. And it's, you paid your soldiers in salt. And that's where the word salary comes from and so on. So uh, salt was really important before refrigeration. Hey, this has been so much fun. Thank you, Lisa, for the questions. And thank you for all of you for attending. I want to remind you next week, we're going to celebrate Christmas right here in Europe. And that's going to be a lot of fun. And uh, we're going to remind all of us right now, you have the most fun when you get out of your comfort zone and you make mistakes and when you can laugh at your mistakes. And I want to finish off with a few bloopers. And just for a little sneak peek at these bloopers, um, there's a, a bunch of them in a row. One of them, I am um, demonstrating the importance of wearing a helmet when you're in one of these tunnels. Uh, another one is imagining a war coming at you from Hadrian's Wall over there, keeping the Scottish people out. 
uh, getting annoyingly poetic up in the Cumbrian Lake District where Wordsworth was the great poet. Uh, I enjoyed an impromptu concert with Maria, the wife of Ollie in Gimmelwald. Most of us know Ollie because he's always with me when I'm in Switzerland. Ollie, the school teacher in Gimmelwald. He's got a wonderful wife and she's a beautiful musician. And every time I'm there, she plays on the violin that she made herself. And I get to play the piano on a Sauter piano from the Black Forest in Germany, the same as my Sauter right here. And we do a little impromptu concert there. Then I pitch some hay up in the Alps and I realize I'd rather be a farmer pitching hay than some things. And then I go visit a very late moment in a wine tasting on the Rhine River before making the most out of a little spring rainstorm in England. Let's go for some bloopers to wrap things up. And here we go. Ready? Yeah. without Simon laughing. Started at 14, digging graves with a shovel, is it? Starts are coming. Ah, the blooms. Clouds were heavy on the turn. <laughs> Still without talking, you clown. <laughs> again, you're always gardening. Here you got the geraniums out. I always pull them back in the spring. They, they blossom better the next year, you know, you just... Yeah. Is this still Bach? <laughs> ah, I got calluses on my hands. I'm a mountain man. Enough of this travel writer stuff. Zum Wohl. Oh, baby, this is mine. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Lisa. Hey, Rick. Good night, Amy. Good night, Rick. Good night, Amy. <laughs> <laughs>